Bible is open to 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 3. We'll be looking at that in just a moment. There was a, a very wealthy man in uh, San Antonio. He was sued by his wife for divorce. And the settlement was 20, she was asking 28000 per month. She, a breakdown of that was this. She wanted $10,446 a month for vacation. Clothing, $6,452. To eat out was $2,600. Gifts, $2,200. Groceries, $1,592. A beauty parlor, she asked for $1,440 per month. She had more hair than I've got. Miscellaneous, fourteen oh seven, pet care, one hundred and seventy one, and church charities, twenty dollars. You see anything wrong with that? Well, I see a whole lot wrong with it, but twenty dollars for church charities. A couple of weeks ago, I started a series of lessons on New Testament worship, what the Bible says about we looked at the idea that there are three Greek words used in the New Testament uh, that would indicate worship, how to worship. Primarily, 60 times the word propio is mentioned. That means to bow down or pay homage to. We looked at that in detail. We talked about how that worship is not necessarily our benefit, but it is to show our respect and our reverence for to God. Of course, we will benefit from our worship. We talked about, two weeks ago, how that is not for our entertainment. We're not here today because we want to be entertained. We're here today because we love the Lord and we want to show our respect and reverence to Him. Last week I talked about, uh, or two weeks ago I guess it was, the Lord's Supper, the communion of the Bible. Uh, that was instituted by the Lord in Matthew 26, 26 through 29, and once again uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 26. Last week we talked about how important teaching and uh, preaching is in our worship to God. We looked at Nehemiah 8, and we saw when the Word of God was being read publicly, how the people uh, stood and respected God. Today we want to look at giving. I wrote a bulletin article, and I said uh, that preachers don't like to preach on giving. I, can, I have preached thousands of sermons in 40 years preaching the gospel, and I have probably not preached on giving more than 20 times. It is uh, not because uh, that it's, it's not important. It is very important. It's not because I don't feel the need but preachers sometimes don't like to preach on giving, just like uh, my wife and uh, Carol was visiting with a man the other day, and they were inviting him to come to church, and he said, ah, oh, church is all about money. And that's, that's kind of the, the mentality of the world. It's all about money. And in reality, it's not all about money. If that's what you're focused on, you're focused on the wrong thing. It's all about giving. It's all about sharing, not just your money, but your life. Now, in 1 Corinthians 16, notice what the text says. Now concerning the collection for the saints. So who is he talking to? He's talking to the saints. Brethren, never is the church obligated or is the church going to ask the world to support the work of the church. That's only the saints, for the brethren. And he says, for the collection of the saints, as I have given order to the churches Galatia, so do you. Upon the first day of the week, and all of this terminology is very important. Upon the first day of the week, let it e every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. And when I come, Whosoever ye shall approve by your letters, them will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. I want to look today of giving as worship. 
First of all, you will note, he said in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 16, as I have given order to the other churches. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 17, he said that I am been teaching these things in other places. Paul said, I'm teaching this. This is directed to the churches of Galatia. It was not just merely a culture thing just for the church at Corinth. Paul said, what I'm teaching you, I've taught, according to 1 Corinthians 4, verse 17, I've taught this to other churches also. So it is a command. It's important that this be taught in every congregation, Paul said. And you'll notice uh, that this contribution that Paul was talking about was not just for a particular reason per se, but it was, and it wasn't for the purpose that God needed the money. Friends, God owns everything. He doesn't need your money. But it is a test of your faith. It's an indication of your love and your allegiance and your loyalty to the one who created everything in this earth. So let's look at the first day of the week. Go back to the text now in verse number 2. Upon the first day of the week. The King James says upon the first day of the week. Let me tell you what the New American Standard word uh, says. The New American Standard says, and it's correct, it is every first day of the week. That would be correct. In other words, the, the Greek word kata, kata is what we call a distributive force. It literally is that when the Christians come together, they are to come together every first day of the week. That's the force of it. Not just when you come together, but you come together every first day of the week. Hebrews 10 uh, verse 25, we looked at that passage last week. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Exhorting one another, encouraging one another so much more as you see that day approaching. Now, I want you to notice also in our text uh, that they assembled on the first day of the week. It says upon the first day of the week. Did they not do the same thing in Troas? In Acts 20 verse 6, Paul got there and he staged days because he knew that they would come to partake of the Lord's Supper? Did he not know that they would be meeting on the first day of the week? If I were traveling to Ephesus, let's just say Ephesus, and I go by, and there were a lot of trade routes, it was a seaport, going to Ephesus, and I was looking for the church of Christ at Ephesus, I would go on the first day of the week to find that congregation, meeting, assembling, Worshiping the Lord, uh, the Lord by uh, partaking of the Lord's Supper, and they would be giving of their means. In 1 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 11 and verse number 18, what were they doing? They were coming together into one place. They were assembling together to worship God. Somebody says, well, you have to. If you've got the attitude that you have to, you're looking at it the wrong way. You get to. It's an honor. These people were worshiping together on the first day of the week. And one of the things that they were doing, as I've got them listed there, they were assembling, they were singing, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15. We'll be looking at that next week. And how if uh, to, that we are to sing with the Spirit, we are to sing with the understanding, we are to pray with the Spirit and pray with the understanding. So here you have a congregation of God's people in the city of Corinth. They were meeting on the first day of the week. That's not by coincidence. That is, according to this Greek word, kata, is every first day of the week. Every week. So when the church came together to partake of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, they did it on every first day of the week because that's what the word means. Now, each one of you, go back to the text now. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you, let each one of you. A Christian has an obligation to partake of the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. Also, a Christian has the obligation that we give of our means. We call that Christian participation. I like it when mamas and daddies, when they give their children a quarter or a dollar or whatever, uh, five dollars, whatever you give them, and they drop it in the plate. You know what you're doing? 
you're teaching them the importance of giving to God. It's not the necessarily the, the importance of the dollar itself. It's the importance of what you're teaching them that when they come together as a church that we are obligated, every one of us, it's not just the responsibility of a few, it's the responsibility of every one of us to give. Now you compare that with singing. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching it and monster. Who? Every one of us. That's the reason we don't have a choir up here or a chorus up here. I had a picture last week of a band. That's the reason we don't have that. You know why? Because the Bible commands every one of us to sing. Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3, 16. To partake of the Lord's... When you come together, 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 26, when you come into one place to partake of the Lord's Supper. Who partakes of the Lord's Supper? Christians do. According to 1 Corinthians 11 verse 26, and you got the praying, and you got the preaching. All of this is participation. Nowhere as Christians are we to be passive when we come to worship. We are to be active. We're active listeners. We're active in applying it. We're active in partaking of the Lord's Supper as Christians. We're active in singing to God. We are participating. And when we give our money, when we give to the Lord, we are commanded to do that. And we do it not because we're obligated, but because we love God. Not only that, notice it says, lay by Him. Lay by Him. That, in the Greek, is literally, personally, let Him set aside. It doesn't say lay aside at home. But you let Him, you let Him decide how much He's going to give. You let Him uh, lay it aside. Let Him plan His worship. That's what it really means. Plan your worship. You don't, oh, by the way, here comes the plate. I'm going to throw in a dollar. Oh, yeah, or I'm going to give a hundred. I forgot about it. No, you, you, you planned this. That's what it literally means. Lay by Him. You purposed it. You planned it. Such laying up at home would, defend, uh, would defeat this instruction that God has given here. Oh, I'm going to keep it at home. No, you have a church treasure. Someone, and there's the argument I've read not too long ago where somebody says, you can't find a church treasure in the Bible. Terry just read for us in that scripture that talked about the treasure. Under the old law, under the Jewish law. And, by the way, when he says, do you lay by in store that there be no gatherings when I come, so who's, it, who's, who's laying it by? Christians. What are they doing with it? Evidently, somebody was in charge of this. I would suggest the local eldership was in charge of it. And when Paul came by, he was going to get it. It was, it was somewhere. It might not have been in a bank. But somewhere, these Christians were giving their money. It was being kept. It was being laid by and uh, for the purpose of doing God's work. Paul was giving instructions that would prevent a mass gathering when he arrived. Verse 2, you lay by in store. When, Paul? Upon the first day of the week. When? Every first day of the week. For what purpose? That there be no gatherings when I come. Now, I want you to notice as he may prosper. I want you to look in verse number 2. As God hath prospered him. Literally, the New English Bible, and I wouldn't recommend it, but they did get this part right, in proportion to his gains. That is correct. In other words, when a person gives, they are to give the amount that is in proportion to what he makes. How much? I don't know. We'll look at that in just a moment. I want you to notice also that there is no hint of tithing in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. That had been removed. In 1 Corinthians 7 19, he talks about how uh, circumcision or not circumcision availeth nothing. It doesn't matter. You remember Colossians 2 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, contrary to us. He took it out of the way and he nailed it to the cross. He came to establish the new law. He took away the old law. And if the first law had been perfect, there would be no need for the second law, the writer of Hebrews tells us. So what do you have? You've got people, individuals, that they must prosper, or as they prosper, they must purpose. 
You talk about it. You think about it. You plan. Also, I want you to notice, nothing is said here about investigating personal incomes. I would be very careful as an elder or even without elders to meet with people and say, okay, we want to know what you make, we want to know what your expenses are, and we, we don't think you're giving enough. Uh, and I think that's dangerous. I think it's up to each individual, just like as we come to partake of the Lord's Supper, you're supposed to examine yourself, you partake of the Lord's Supper yourself, and when it comes to giving, you have to purpose, you have to plan in your mind, in your family, and you do that, and it is your responsibility that He may prosper. Now, in the end, we're going to look at some key words to all of this. Also, notice your gift is to Jerusalem. Your gift is to Jerusalem. This passage has never been used to show as an all-scriptural usage of the first day of the week collection. I disagree with that. Some of our brethren say that this has to go to saints and saints only. The only way that the church can use the funds for Christians. Don't, don't think that's what Paul's got in mind at all. If he did, it would violate a lot of... Let me just go show you a couple of passages that would prove that wrong. 2 Corinthians 9, I want to show you something here. I want you to go down to about uh, verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, let's go to verse 8. And God is able to make grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Then he talks about the poor. He had dispersed abroad. This is Psalm 12, verse 112, 9. He had dispersed abroad. He had given to the poor. His righteousness remaineth forever. He's talking about the poor in verse number 9 and 10. He's talking about the administration. There was an administration of this work that was supplied the saints. But look in verse 13. And I've had this discussion several times. Verse 13. While... Whilst by the experiment of their, manifest, of their ministration they glorify God for your professed sub, uh, subjection unto the gospel of Christ, for your liberal distri distribution unto them. Who's them? The saints. And then to all men. That, does that not harmonize with Galatians 6.10? Therefore, as you uh, have opportunity to do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith, Friends, Jesus, when he fed people, he didn't go around and say, Okay, now are you, uh, are, are you in a covenant relationship with the Lord? Are you serving God? Here's your fish. If you are, if you're not, you're going to starve. her. Why the Lord? That's right against what the Lord taught. And friends, to say that the, the church treasury can only be used uh, for Christians is uh, going beyond what's written. It's also... Nowhere in Scripture does it say that we can have a, a pie supper? Can we have a rummage sale, a yard sale, as a church to raise funds for the work of the church? You don't find that in Scripture. Yeah, that's going beyond what's written. What you find is God's people that love the Lord, love one another come together to worship God, they come and they sing and they pray, they partake of the Lord's Supper, they are listening, listening actively to the Word of God, and they give as they prospered in proportion to, to what you make, in proportion to your gains, and that's all the authority that you have. The use of collected funds to support the preaching of the gospel. If it be in India, it be here, wherever in a lot of different locations, going to school, uh, learning and developing their skills. We, su we support India. We support Jamaica. We support uh, house to house, heart to heart. Why? Because that's what the Word says is the purpose of these funds. Number two, we are able to relieve physical members of, uh, of the church, whatever their needs are. Now, that doesn't mean just because the church is supposed to help the poor that you take advantage of the church. 
I've, I've seen that happen through the years where that folks wouldn't hit a lick at a snake and they think the church is obligated. They think the church is obligated to pay all their bills while they do nothing. The, that's in violation of other scriptures that says that we're supposed to work. If a man won't work and take care of his own, uh, then he's worse than an infidel. And so, but the church... We have an obligation, we have responsibility to help members of our congregation that's having a hard time. And this church has done that many times. And I appreciate you doing that. We're to edify the members. Provide what is necessary for teaching and worship. Whatever is uh, under the scope of edification, uh, we could use uh, these funds to do that, to help the poor. Now, I want to give you some words to remember as we close today. Number one, listen to this. It is a command. I remember the first time that I was in Atlanta, uh, preaching in Atlanta at a new place, and uh, the elders asked me to preach on giving. And I preached on giving, and there was an older lady there that you could hear. You could, she was hard of hearing, so you could hear her everywhere, and she said... Uh, well, there's another preacher preaching on money again. And uh, I have thought about that many, many times. Brethren, what, what if we get everything right? And because we're so stingy that we don't want to give the Lord, not our leftovers, but to give the Lord because He's commanded us to do that. Somebody says, well, you think the Lord's going to hold us accountable to that? Well, if we can violate that commandment, and then how many more commandments can you just overlook or just refuse to obey and it still be okay? You tell me because that's, that's the direction you're going. When God says, and upon the first day of the week, let each one of you give and lay by and store, that is a command. That's not optional. There's a lot of things that may be optional. What you wore today may be optional to you. I mean, you chose what you wanted to wear. I chose what my wife wanted me to wear. And uh, that's just the way it is, you know. That's okay. That's okay. But brethren, we come to worship. This is a serious matter. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter what your opinion is about the matter. It doesn't matter what somebody else thinks about it. It doesn't matter that people of the world think we're all about money and we don't want to ask for money. Did you know this church has never, ever, not one time, or any place I've ever preached, not one time, asked the world for money? Not one time. It's not the world's responsibility to do the work of the church. It's our responsibility. Remember that. It's a command. That's the reason we preach on it. God says to. Number two... We're supposed to give as we prosper. We don't give God our leftovers. Did you know when they offered a lamb or a bull or a lamb, you know they were not supposed to get uh, one that had blemish? You get the one that's without blemish. You don't get the weak one of, the, of your, of your uh, flock or of your cattle. No, you give the best. God deserves the best. Now, if that was true under the old law... And that old law was an imperfect law, and, and Christ came and took away that law. How much more important is, is it today for us to give as we prosper? Did you know this congregation, and never any, not one congregation where I preach, would ever send you a bill, or a send, if you miss, they would say, uh, by the way, you owe so-and-so because you missed. That's up to you. I'd recommend uh, that you give. And you give and make up your giving. Make up your giving. But I, I tell you right now, brethren, this thing is an individual responsibility that we give as we prosper. And I'll be honest with you. Through the years, it's kind of bothered me because people have asked me, how much do you think I ought to give? I don't know. I really don't know. What, what about 10%? That's what they gave me. I, I don't, uh, I can't say that. Maybe more than that. I don't know. That's up to each individual to give as they prosper. But I would suggest to you, as he says in 2 Corinthians 8, listen to this, that every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And uh, then he said that we are to give liberally. In 2 Corinthians 8, they first gave themselves 
uh, before they gave of their money. Let me say this, and we're going to close. I know a congregation where there were some individuals that did not like the way the elders were spending the money. And they didn't really like uh, this particular preacher that they had years ago at, uh, in another county. And uh, so in order for them to get this preacher to leave, the, uh, the contribution went down to nothing. All the members decided, they, oh, we know what we'll do. We'll starve him out. We won't give our money on the first day of the week. Brethren, that's wrong. That's sinful. If the elders misuse money, they'll be held accountable for that. It's not optional whether we're going to get here. And by the way, any giving that we do on the side extra than our, our contribution, that has to be extra. I disagree with saying I'm going to take my contribution because the elders won't, or the men, if you don't have elders, and I want them to support this work. They don't support that work, so I'm going to take all my contribution and I'm going to send it myself. That's a violation of Scripture. That's not what the Bible says. We are to give as we have been commanded. We are to give as we prosper. We're to give liberally. We are to give cheerful. Someone says, do you give till it hurts? I believe you ought to give till it feels good. I'm happy about what I'm giving. I feel good about the fact that I've worshipped God today by partaking of the Lord's Supper. I, I feel good today because I've been able to pray to God and, and, and we've been able to sing and blend our voice. I feel good. I ought to feel good about my giving. I ought to feel good about the idea of reaping and sowing bountifully. Did you know, as an elder told me one time, he's dead now, he told me that you can't outgive God. He said, when you, every week, he said, the first thing you do is to lay aside what you're going to give to the Lord. Then you pay your bills. And then you uh, go out to eat if you want to do that, if you've got money. And he said, if you'll do that, God will bless you. Somebody said, oh, hell, you're talking about the gospel of prosperity. Oh, more you give, God's going to bless you. You know, you, you buy this towel for five bucks and you're going to get ten in return. That's not what I'm talking about at all. What you do find in Scripture, though, is that more you give to God, God's going to bless you. And that's not just your money, but that's your time, that's your talents, that's your ability. Reap bountifully. Whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Today is, this is a, a difficult subject because it's hard to say how much, okay, you're going to give this, you're going to give that. There was a couple one time that came to my office and sat down with me and they said, we, we want you to help us uh, to make a budget. Okay, who's going to help me make a budget? But I'll help you. I tried to. When I was in Atlanta, we had a church secretary, and she said, uh, so-and-so wants you, they're here to, for you to make a budget for them. A budget? And I told him, I said, you need to call Dave Ramsey. He can do that. <laughs> I don't know much about money. But you know what their attitude was? I'm not saying you have to do this. That's up to you. But i tell you what his attitude was. He said, every time he, he worked for himself on the side, Plus, he worked in a factory, and he said, every time I make money, before I do anything else, I put it to the side, and I'm going to make sure the Lord gets that money, a portion of it. I said, you don't need my help. I need your help. That's the right attitude to have, brother. Not because this church needs your money. You, 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 I've heard people say, well, I'm not going to give money there because they don't need it. Brethren, listen. Every year, we almost start out at zero. Almost start out at zero. Our elders, they make a decision on, okay, what are we going to do? We've got this money to bank. They're, they, I've been in those meetings. What are we going to do with it? We're going to, we're going to send 10000 to uh, GBN to help spread the gospel. We give uh, World Video Bible School. We're going to give them 10000 or 20000 I don't know the number. What, what I'm saying is they're looking 
for opportunities to help, to be involved. We're not in the business of, of making money by putting it in the bank and drawing interest. That's not what the church is about. When I was uh, going from congregation to congregation raising funds, and sometimes you'd look on the board and they'd have $600,000 in a savings account. And I'm there trying to beg for some help for a preacher over in India that's needing $50 to preach the gospel. $600,000. I don't believe that will ever ever happen here. Brethren, when we think, think about worship, one of the unique things about the Lord's church, we have no mandates. We have no high hierarchy. You're not going to get a letter in the mail from someone and or a organization that's connected with the Lord's church and say, hey, uh, you owe us, or this is the way you've got to give, this is how much our elders don't operate that way. We're not going to operate. That's individual responsibility. But brethren, I beg you and plead with you, don't take shortcuts. Think seriously about all of your worship, about giving, and what God can do in using our funds to help the poor, the needy, to help spread the gospel, to edify the church. And it's all to the glory of God. It's all to the glory of God. If I'm your preacher a year from now, you might hear another sermon on giving. But I may not. Because I feel guilty when I'm trying to tell people how to give, but my obligation, my responsibility is to stand up as a messenger of God from His book and trying to get people to give and to worship God acceptably. If you're not a Christian today, why don't you think about your soul? Why don't you obey the gospel of Jesus Christ? <clears throat> we sing the song every week <clears throat> for your invitation. It's not my invitation, it's the Lord's inviting you to come and to obey the gospel, to repent of your sins based upon your faith that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and be baptized in Christ by the blood of Jesus that He might wash away all of your sins, that you might be added to that true body of Christ as God's people living and serving and faithfully before God. If you need to come back home, you've got sin in your life and you need the prayers of this good congregation, we'd bid you to come while together we stand as we sing together.